I'm going to talk about tactile, tactile transference. But first, I'm just going to make it uh, sort of simple and start from the beginning. And I am also a sculptor. Um, and so I've done things like, you know, with bronze. Um, and I've worked with materials, um, mixed media materials like paper, and um, worked with materials like plaster, uh, you know, these three quarter life or life scale figures, mixed media. Again, started to introduce some electronics to the whole thing, you know, with this um, interpretation of uh, a kind of a dangerous tree, and it ended up that technology took over. Did some installations, uh, large scale installations. That's Miles Thurgood, uh, Australian collaborator, and we did this piece uh, called Life Lights and the railing in the um, in the uh, River Markets and uh, just next to Vancouver it was interactive, so you can go and you could play with this giant organ thing, and it would do these things with the lights. And so I was just kind of messing around really with technology, which became a kind of obsession. I started building this interactive furniture. Uh, this one is called the love seat, the interactive love seat. So you sit in it and uh, you have controls. You can red or green dial your partner if you're in agreement or disagreement and then the chair will slowly deflate if there's a disagreement and it will come back to being a right if everything is in good order. Uh, and you know, then some other sort of more conceptual pieces. So this is 32 uh, robotic human cast faces. Um, that had eyes that would watch your movements in the gallery space. So you're walking past this wall and 30, and they were cast from real faces. So, uh, you know, it was uh, an interesting study in, in self-reflexivity and you don't actually need someone else to be looking at you and, you know, for you to feel strange. Anyway, so I've been sculpting for about 18 years. Not a tremendous amount of time, uh, but enough time to sort of learn some things. And I'm also a, a teacher. I've been teaching at the university level for about uh, seven and a half years now. It's just a little bit of experience. There's some videos online if you want to check them out about my students' work. And they do also interactive sculpture, which can sometimes be interpreted as industrial design uh, or, and or mixed media type things. Sometimes we say interactive arts, uh, et cetera, electronic arts. Anyway, one of the hardest things to teach is someone else to teach someone else how to interact with the material world. This is a difficult thing. This is the transference of this kind of tacit, tactile experience. So, you know, we have all these different movements that need to be done physically to manifest these things sculpturally. But it's difficult to communicate that to a student. Uh, you know, we can diagrams. This is a very classical <laughs> method. I'm sure going back to cave paintings, demonstrate it right in front of you. I'm right here. There's another communication maybe happening besides what's being said and being touched in this kind of other space. You feel what I'm saying. We have video. We have all kinds of codifications of mediated experiences representing knowledge that we attempt to try to transfer then downward. But in fact, touch knowledge is a tacit knowledge. So tacit knowledge is this kind of a knowledge that can't be codified. It can't as of yet. Uh, it's a kind of a, a felt experience that we don't have a library for. You can't go and look up in the library, uh, uh, you know, mar uh, or 18th century marble uh, as per this given uh, sculptural experience. And something I should mention, I think that the classical experience of sculpture would be that you would go to uh, wherever the sculpture was in a public space. You might be so tempted as to start touching it. Well, by doing so, you're feeling the finished final felt touched experience of the sculptor. You might actually learn something through those touch experiences. You might get a little bit curious. What is this sculpture thing? If you were lucky or fortunate enough to be a part of a family which was within this type of uh, uh, practice, you might graduate from curious to uh, mentor to uh, perhaps uh, being an apprentice to perhaps being uh, your own master. Perhaps 20, 30 years later, you could become an artist but today you can do it in the third grade if you're creative. <coughs> so how do we achieve tactile transference? Well, traditionally, this was taught over a lifetime, a whole lifetime. You know, hand on hand, 
generational knowledge. And we're not just talking about you know, a professor at a university or a high school or some stranger. This is your relative. This is a very close, this is a kind of a body of yours, an extension. It's easier this way. So this is how they would do it. Uh, but, alas, once we reached a certain place in art, uh, the requirement uh, for skilled artistic labor, if you will, or, uh, was not really needed anymore. This ready-made concept kind of killed the requirement for uh, sculpture-making skills in the traditional sense. And of course, everybody's going to jump on that one because, you know, now I don't have to prove myself with a lifetime of touch. Then you add to that uh, machining tools, you know, this kind of a revolution that happened in machines, and we end up with this computer numerical controlled CNC machines. These are just receiving instructions from a computer and dialing out a design somewhere in a factory uh, that produces the um, artifacts that we may purchase on our way out of town. This reduces our interaction with our environment, our physical world, to the keyboard and the mouse, of which we produce three-dimensional things <laughs> and print them on a 3D printer. Voila. <laughs> but it's without touch. It's an enormous assumption that the materials will simply behave. And we're eliminating the touch, the tacit experience of learning sculpture from the program. This is a problem. I see this as a huge problem. So, why would we need it anyway? Why this touch thing? We have the machines, they can do it. What's, what's the big deal? Why do we need the touch experience? Well, we have strength, speed, accuracy, and repeatability with machines. And that's done a lot for us. It really has. It's been able to move us through a, a huge amount of development. But we also have the creativity, the intuition, the knowledge, the experience. These are tangible things which can be applied to the material world to produce artifacts which are useful, have form and function, express uh, everything about us. This is proven by all of artifacts ever created from the beginning of time. <clears throat> Maybe in the middle you get a kind of a dual personality eventually, one day. But as for now, there is a proven uh, case study in telerobotic surgery. So telesurgery, for those who have not uh, heard of it yet, is the ability for your surgeon to perform surgery on you from a remote location so they don't have to mess up their vacation and they can just go over to the cl local clinic and get you fixed up and go back out to the sailboat. I'm just kidding. It's a method of transferring touch through a haptic experience uh, using robotics in remote uh, surgery situations. So this exists and it's being used. Um, the technology is always improving because it's hard for us to communicate a touch sensation in one place to another place, but we'll talk about it in a minute how that's possible. So my response to that was to build ArtBot. And this is just getting along with this whole notion of uh, art that does something. Uh, although I do believe that all art, even if only a point of being aesthetic, so it only has, or let's say its primary feature is the form, that is the function. And that's good for a sculptor. It's something which really elates me. <coughs> anyway, so we built this. Uh, by we, I mean, I am sorry about that. I built this sculpture. And what it is, is it's a robotic arm made from recycled bicycle components, um, which has a chainsaw on the end of it. And uh, so the chainsaw is operated by these video game controllers here. And when you push the big red button, the chainsaw moves. Underneath the big red button is a vibration speaker. There's a high definition microphone, which is right at the end of the tool. So the sound is literally translated straight into your palm. So you, you, you hear with your palm the movements of the chainsaw. In addition, this whole structure here is one connected piece. So whenever the chainsaw is doing any kind of like serious kickback, when you have uh, your youngsters who don't really respect the notion of force, pushing it all, it can be pushed and breaking it in its first show. Uh, it will give you feedback. It moves your entire body up or down according to whatever's happening uh, on the machine. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, a bunch of videos. You can check it out on the web. Here it is in show uh, 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 and uh, here's just an example of a happy feedback coming in your hand of a very very young boy. 
So you have here the ability to uh, mix the benefits of machine developments with the intuitive uh, 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 nature of a uh, human participant, but without removing the haptic tactile element so that you can respect the material properties uh, and uh, go forth with the technology. I'm not one to say technology is a bad thing. I think it's great, but I think we need to kind of get a little more in there. Uh, so again, you have this very young child operating a high-powered chainsaw, ripping through wood uh, right in front of his own, oh, they loved it. I mean, it was just a lineup. And like I said, they destroyed it, so I need some modification. <coughs> um, yeah. So there's some videos online. I, I you know, encourage everyone to go and check them out. So just about the future development of where this is going, and there's big plans to make it happen. But of course, these kind of things uh, cost money for artists, and uh, so it becomes a little bit of a challenge at a certain point. But I think this is where collaboration with uh, other uh, institutions of learning can be valuable, uh, or just kind of uh, you know, creative manufacturing. The whole process was sculptural. I built the whole thing without having a design. I just went to a recycled bike yard and grabbed some parts and went to the metal shop and started chopping it all down. And, looked up like what's an actuator and blah 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 and I go learn all that stuff and you know like plug it all together and suddenly you have this thing that does this job. So I think we could engineer that way. I actually really do believe that. I, there's proof. The, the whole video series to show that. Anyway, let's imagine for a second that there is some very high powered uh, robotic arm and it's an industrial robotic arm. When you see like manufacturing cars and things like that, powerful. At the end there's a tool so it's working on some material. And over here in my hand, I have a manipulator or a controller, which when I move it, it moves the industrial robot in the same synchronous fashion. And then there's a third arm yet, which is another kind of a controller, that a student would hold, and it would be moving in synchronous fashion as well. All three of them simultaneously moving at the same time. And now I'm sculpting into the piece, and I feel it, the student feels it. We're not even speaking. I may mention one, did you notice the wood grain? Yes. And I continue. That's it. We're speaking in touch, and we're recording the event as well. So we could get some well-known sculptors, whoever still remains and respects that of the uh, material world, many of which are still in uh, places like Greece and Italy and Spain and so on. And they could come and use the machine, and we could have a library of tactile experiences with different materials that could be useful for industrial designers, engineers, uh, for artists themselves, for material scientists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that they could look up. They could say, what does oak from this Canadian forest feel like when using this rotary tool uh, at this speed? But, 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 boom, here it is. Touch it, feel it, you know. You've felt that. But what that gives you is the ability to be more ethical with your use of the materials. Let me explain that a little bit. Right now, when we put something in a CNC machine, the tool is just meant to be strong enough to pound through whatever the material is. If it's wood, well, the bit just has to be strong enough to just grind it, no problem. But imagine there was a bit which could respond intelligently to the material. Your energy use would be reduced by almost 90%. And not only that, the material responses that are happening intelligently to the computer you know, in this kind of cycle could eventually result in an artificially intelligent haptic system where you could literally have the computer doing the teaching, teaching us. We could then move into the virtual. And I think that would be the responsible way forward rather than jumping straight into the third uh, dimension, assuming the world will follow our instructions uh, to the bitter last end. Thank you very much. <laughs>